Earth, our fragile planet. Who doesn't like Earth? Who? Who? Hello, and welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. This week for Earth Day, we're going to look at Earth, our fragile planet. We're going to be joined later in the show by Dr. Catherine Calvin, Chief Scientist and Senior Climate Advisor for NASA. Earth, the planet nearest and dearest to our hearts, not to mention our feet, is our planetary cradle and for now our only home. As our species reaches out to other planets and beyond, our world will continue to be our birthplace in the cosmos. Throughout the last four and a half billion years or so, the Earth has seen numerous traumatic events. The first of these took place when our planet was just a baby, less than 100 million years old. That's 5,218 million weeks for all of you new parents out there. As the solid surface of the Earth was still taking shape, our nascent world was struck by a Mars-sized body called Thea, forming the Moon. An Earth-shattering kaboom. Life took root early on our young world, but for the vast majority of the history of our planet, this life remained simple, one-celled organisms. Who's simple? And were we to visit this time, we would find the Earth an alien, hostile world, wrapped in what we would quickly find to be a poisonous atmosphere. <laughs> now, when cyanobacteria evolved 2.4 billion years ago, these organisms developed photosynthesis, direct drawing energy directly from the sun, leading the way to the later development of plants. I like plants. The waste product of cyanobacteria, oxygen, began to fill the atmosphere more than two billion years before our time. Now, what might seem like an improvement for us was a disaster for life around the globe. This great oxidation event spelt the end of the road for organisms for whom oxygen was poisonous. I mean, right. So things then settled down for a long time. Later, life decided it takes a village to raise a cell and singular cells began living together. Mitochondria took their place as the energy centers of some of these cells. Now, then they became controlled by a central nucleus, and the first eukaryotic cells took their place on the world stage, leading the way to complex life. I'm so complex. The first animals appeared 800 million years ago or so, including the first sponges and Rolling Stones guitarist Keith Richards. At the time, there was still little free oxygen in the oceans of Earth. However, sponges were able to live in the low oxygen environment by, well, not really doing much of anything at all. They just sit there all day waiting for food to flow by. Anyway, these colonies formed the first reefs seen on Earth. Oxygen levels rose over time and the first worms began to burrow along the sea floor. The Cambrian explosion was a genetic jackpot, and life proliferated for over 55 million years, 500, starting 540 million years before our time. Animals developed shells, and we can only assume the first shell game developed soon after. Now, adorable little trilobites lived in these ancient oceans, thriving in a diverse range of environments. From 485 million years ago, Nearly all the most basic forms of life had already become established. Now, 440 million years ago, climatic changes resulted in rising ocean temperatures, wiping out 85% of all ocean species. Yeah! The 3rd of May, we're going to look at water worlds of the cosmos. We're going to be joined by Time Magazine's first hero of the planet, oceanographer Dr. Sylvia Earle. Here's a look forward to that interview. So tell us a little bit about how are oceans being affected by global climate change? Well, not good news. The planet is warming and so is the ocean. That's having an impact on kelp forests that like cold water. Mm -hmm. They're declining for a number of reasons, but temperature is one. Coral reefs, about half are already gone. And one of the biggest factors is climate change, a warming ocean. I mean, most 
coral reefs like warm water, but they don't want it to be too warm for too long. Mm -hmm. This is the zooxanthellae, the little organisms that live within the tissues of reef building corals to, uh, to escape. And often that ends with the coral dying. So big problems, but also big news. We know what to do. Nations around the world for the land and the sea are committing to embracing on the order of at least 30% to give back to nature. We've taken so much mm. throughout all of our history. It's overdue for us to restore health to forests and other natural systems on the land. Already about 15% of terrestrial areas are protected, only about 3% of the ocean. Yet the ocean is the dominant feature that, that governs climate governs mm. planetary chemistry. It's home for most of life on Earth. We have to really amp up in a hurry to safeguard our life support system. And we have a, a, a listener question. Mark from Ontario wants to know, is there a tipping point at some point in the future, 2028 or wherever, where the effects of global climate change on the oceans will be irreversible? And if so, when might it be? The when it might be is not precisely knowable, but that we are on a trend that does not bode well for the planet, for us. And climate scientists and biologists, others are saying, look, we've got the next 10 years, more or less. It doesn't mean that all at once, life stops, but it's going to get harder and harder to reverse the, the warming trend. And the, the tipping point means that you get to a point where nothing we can do will be sufficient to achieve a turning point before those dreaded tipping points. Hmm. It's still achievable according to the best and brightest minds out there that it's why the sense of urgency, come on, we can do it. <laughs> why are we waiting? Why are we, you know, just, why not have that everyday sense of urgency every day? What can I do? What can I motivate our leaders to do? The, who can we put in office who really understands and is willing to stand up and say, let's, Let's take the action that safeguards everything we care about. It's our security, it's our health. How oh, come on, it's our very existence. We need to be able to breathe. We need a climate, we need a temperature regime that favors us. We've had it for the better part of the last 10,000 years. And we're <laughs> perversely would seem doing everything in our power to, to turn in the wrong direction. We need to just, you know, flip it, do everything in our power to go in the right direction. And, and every one of us, not just the leaders of countries and companies, every one of us can do something. And together, it takes everybody doing something to, you know, we can't all do the same things. What all of us can be mindful of what's within our grasp to restore nature, to think of what we're doing that's harming nature the choices we make about consuming ocean wildlife. It takes a bite out of our life support system. We've got plenty of other things we can choose to eat. We don't have to eat tuna and swordfish and the wild things that are necessary to safeguard planetary chemistry and maintain the carbon cycle in a way that works in our favor. Some people need to eat ocean wildlife. But most of us do not. It's a choice, it's a habit, it's a luxury. And other things that we can do, what do we wear? How do we travel? <laughs> what, what, what can we learn? What can we get others to be inspired to do? To look in the mirror and, you know, ask yourself, what can I do today and every day to change the trajectory of decline into a better world now and far into the future.
That's great. Thanks so much, Sylvia. It was great talking with you again. Great talking with you too. Happy Earth Day. Yes, Ocean Day. Ocean Day. 15 million years later, give or take, a few brave or perhaps foolhardy animals left the safety of the ocean and began to live on land. The first dinosaurs entered stage, entered stage right 230 million years ago and ruled Earth for nearly 165 million years, much longer than humans have walked the Earth. The best known extinction event took place 66 million years ago when our planet was walloped by an asteroid the size of Mount Everest and dinosaurs exited stage left. <laughs> Uh, several species of humanoid creatures evolved a few million years ago, but by, oh, but by 40,000 years ago, only a modern humans remained. This was the era when we developed the first musical instruments as well as began wearing shoes. Language was first fully developed around this time and bookkeeping followed soon thereafter. Dogs and humans joined together 23,000 years ago, and the first loaf of bread was baked 14,000 years before our time. Around 1760, the Industrial Revolution kicked off in Europe and North America. Products which were once made by hand were churned out in vast numbers by the new automated machines, largely powered by coal. Waste from factories began to pollute the air, leading to higher rates of respiratory illness and higher death rates in areas where coal was burnt en masse. And even as early as the 1830s, this waste began to raise average temperatures worldwide. Humans began to change the global climate. Today, as we seek to better understand our world and learn how to mitigate the effects of climate change, we're dependent on space exploration to help monitor and heal our fragile planet. For our Earth Day special, we welcome Dr. Katherine Calvin to the show. She is Chief Scientist and Senior Climate Advisor for NASA. This week for our special Earth Day episode of the Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Dr. Kate Calvin. She is Chief Scientist and Senior Climate Advisor at NASA. Welcome to the show, Kate. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, welcome. So can you tell us, just give us a brief intro, what are some of the ways and some of the missions NASA is undertaking to help monitor and mitigate uh, the effects of climate change here on our planet? Sure. So NASA has this unique vantage point of space where we can see the Earth. We have more than two dozen satellites and instruments in orbit. They measure things like temperature, clouds and precipitation, vegetation, carbon dioxide, changes in ice sheet mass. And we've been collecting this information for decades. So we have a decades long array of earth and atmospheric data that allows us to see the state of the earth today, but also how it's changed. Hmm, that's fabulous. So what are some of the, you know, you touched on this a little bit already, but what are some of the important, most important things that people, you know, really need to know about about our environment and how it's changing. Some of the uh, findings that we've had here are about climate. Um, we, we can see that the temperatures are changing. So climate is ri uh, temperatures are rising and climate is changing. 2021 ties for the sixth warmest year on record. Uh, and alongside these changes in temperature come changes in the extent of Arctic sea ice and the thickness of that ice. We see changes in sea level rise. We see increases in extreme events like heat waves and wildfires that come along with these increases in global mean temperature. Hmm. I think, you know, there's, of course, for one reason or another, there are a lot of, um, it's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of, you know, people who deny the science of climate change. And that's sort of thing. what do you think is something that people that would really change people's minds? What's the one, you know, is there just like one or two amazing facts that, you know, that you would tell these people? 
Well, what the science shows us is both that the climate has changed um, and we're also experiencing those changes now. So we're seeing more extreme events like heat waves and wildfires, floods um, and droughts. And so what science tells us is those are driven by climate change. The IPCC had a report this last summer that said that it was unequivocal that the changes in the Earth's climate are driven by human activity. And we expect that as temperatures, if temperatures continue to rise, those events will continue to occur and increase. Mm -hmm. And just bring us back, what, what got you into a life of science? What, what, what made you become a scientist? So my background's in math, computer science, and engineering, and I started doing research on climate change in grad school. Um, when I got into grad school, I had a math and computer science degree, and I was looking for something to apply those skills to, and I've always spent a lot of time outside. So when I was a kid, I did a lot of camping and boating. Over time, that turned into hiking and biking. And for me, climate and earth science is a way of applying my technical skills to something that matters to me. So did you grow up around animals? Did you have, you know, is that part of what, what made you love the environment so much? Or is it more the majestic landscapes and being in nature? The majestic landscapes and being in nature. So hiking, seeing trees. I still do quite a bit of hiking and I love seeing from the top of a mountain the view of a valley or watching the trees as I walk by and trying to think about, you know, how much carbon do they store? How old are they? Um, and what's their story? Yeah. I, I, to me, I just find nature to be the ultimate source of spirituality and just such a connectiveness of of all life, you know? So uh, what's, you know, starting down a life of science and living a life of science isn't always the easiest thing. So, you know, for young kids who, with their innate sense of wonder, you know, who want to grow up to be scientists, what's, what's your advice to them, especially, you know, young, girl, young women and girls who may face additional pressures I would say just keep asking questions and keep learning. I ask questions every day, and I learn something new every day. And you're sometimes surprised by the direction it might take you, but it's always fun to keep learning, and there's no wrong questions, so I just keep asking. And being here at NASA, it's really great because I have all of these experts, not just on climate and earth science, but also in all aspects of physics and space, and I get to hear from them about their science, and that's really exciting every day. Yeah, it's fabulous. So... What for you represents our our greatest you know, greatest hope for the future? There's a lot of threats out there, you know, especially as uh, human made global warming and and such. But what offers us our greatest hope? So science and innovation have taught us quite a bit about the world we live in. We, we know more about climate change. We understand the universe more. We have all kinds of technologies that we didn't have before, like Zoom, where we're talking today. And we're continuing to learn more. So NASA has a lot of missions coming up in the next year to help us better understand the Earth. Um, so we have a mission launching um, targeted for April right now that's um, six CubeSats that are going to or small satellites that are going to help us understand tropical cyclones. Yeah, we have another, yeah, tropics. Yeah, we have another one I'm really excited about in the um, in the fall in November um, called SWAT that'll help us understand surface waters and ocean. So the ocean plays this really really important role in climate change because it absorbs heat and carbon, and SWAT's going to help us understand that. SWAT's also going to provide the first global survey of water in rivers and lakes. And people use water to produce energy and to grow crops. And knowing how much we have is really important. And so we're learning more, um, and we keep learning more. Absolutely. Water is absolutely essential for so many things. And, um, and certainly there's also the emit mission, looking at mineral dust in the atmosphere and how that affects how it affects things as well. Yes, that's an instrument that'll go on the International Space Station, um, yeah, and it will monitor the sources um, of mineral dust. And mineral dust has an effect on local and regional climate because it affects the way that the Earth absorbs and reflects sunlight. And so that changes the energy balance and the temperature. It also has impacts on air quality, which has implications for human health and ecosystems. Fabulous. And finally, you know, what? how do you see... You know, there's so, so many new private organizations, you know, 
especially SpaceX going up and putting object, uh, putting uh, object satellites into around into orbit around the Earth. Uh, how do you see private space flight and private space companies interacting with and contributing to uh, our knowledge about? So I can only really comment on NASA missions, but we do have commercial partners that help us with our missions. Um, you mentioned SpaceX, um, and we have a, a number of other partners. Um, if you want to know more about how we're enabling um, commercial market in low Earth orbit, we have some experts in that. I can talk more about the science that's going on, like on the International Space Station. Um, we get on the space station, we have a bunch of instruments. We've mentioned EMIT. There are other ones that monitor carbon dioxide or other factors. We also learn quite a bit about Earth from living in space. Um, so some of the growing crops at the space station has informed the way we grow crops in indoor agriculture facilities in the U.S. Right, right. And so I, finally, I'm just going to get one more question out of you. <laughs> sure. Uh, how, how, how soon do you, how difficult do you see the process of putting life in the space? I mean, if we're going to live on the moon and on Mars, we're going to have to grow our own crops there. So we've learned things um, from the International Space Station about that. And so NASA researchers have worked on um, LED lighting um, that's used in the space station. It also is used in indoor agriculture facilities. We've also worked with people to um, produce a fertilizer that releases nutrients to the roots of the plant at the rate they need it. And that helps us grow crops in space. It also has value back on Earth where it can reduce runoff into rivers and lakes. That's great. Well, thanks so much, Kate. It was fabulous talking with you. Yep, thank you. And that was Dr. Catherine Calvin, Chief Scientist and Senior Climate Advisor for NASA. Happy Earth Day. In order to preserve Earth, we must journey into space. Environmental science depends on observations taken from high above our world. As we move out into the cosmos, our planetary cradle remains our first and most welcoming home. Space is a hard place and Earth remains our planetary cradle for now. But the same world which gave birth to our species also taught us to explore, discover, and learn. And to do that, we must journey out to other planets. Join us next week as we look at exoplanets, worlds beyond our solar system. We're going to be joined by astrophysicist Thane, Thane Curry, who recently found a bizarre exoplanet nine times more massive than Jupiter. Join us starting on 26th of April. Please subscribe, follow, and share the Cosmic Companion on all your favorite social media. You're the ones who make this show happen. Visit us anytime at the Cosmic Companion, anywhere. Clear skies. <laughs>